Hello and welcome to Law for Life's introductory course about child protection. My name is Rowan and I work for Law for Life. In the last few years, we have produced several resources about child protection for Roma communities, such as our Child Protection Guide for Roma Parents and our short film, Keeping Our Children Safe. But they can also be useful to anyone who is going through the child protection process. You can find links to both resources below this video. This video is a short introduction to child protection, and it accompanies our digital training on this topic. We are going to cover some key legal concepts and processes, but for a more detailed outline of the child protection legal framework, please look at our guide. We will also briefly cover what often happens before child protection processes and what can happen after. Hello everyone, Gavin Bartale, ahoy, mi romeno hine Teresa, me kerabuchi andro anglitsko. Sara Advocata, Interpret Kahechitelka. My name is Teresia and I'm a Roma advocate. I have supported many Roma families going through the child protection on, on various ways as a, as a consultant, as an advocate, as an interpreter, or as a teacher. I would like to introduce you, Erika, my colleague, who's a trainee solicitor, and is going to explain to us a bit more about the child protection. Um, procedures for Roma families. Thank you, Teresia. Hi, everyone. My name is Erica, and I'm a solicitor. And in my role, I support many families through child protection cases. I'm also working on European uh, project uh, to empower Roma women, especially to get them into education. So as, as we know, Erica, over the years, an increasing number of Roma families living in England have been involved with children's services. Some of them have had to navigate a complex system of child protection. Can we start by explaining what is it that child protection means? Child protection is the name given to the system and processes for protecting children who are suffering or might be at risk of suffering significant harm because of abuse or neglect. I will explain what we mean by abuse or neglect a bit later. Children's services are the key agency responsible for safeguarding children against abuse or neglect in this country. They are based in each local authority in the country and they employ social workers. But most public services that come into contact with children, such as schools, police, health services, children's centers, as well as voluntary organizations will have safeguarding duty toward children as well. What does that mean in practice, Erica? This simply means that all services that you can come across when you have children have duties to protect children against abuse and harm. Can you give us some examples of services that families can be involved with? Let's start from the services for every child in England. These are the services children get from the health visitors, doctors or dentists who help to look after their health or nursery workers and teachers who help to develop and educate them. These services are usually provided without social workers being involved. Parents, when we say parents in this video, we mean both parents and carers. So parents are expected to make sure their children benefit from these services. Some of the ways they can do this include registering with their local GP, going to health visitor clinics when a child is little, going to a doctor and dentist appointments regularly, getting a child vaccinated against childhood illnesses, making sure a child has a place at, at the local school when they turn five, making sure a child goes to school and is on time each school day, working with their child's teacher to support their learning and so on. Parents may receive an invitation letter to do some of these, for example, an appointment for a vaccination, but they'll have to do or organize others by themselves, such as registering with a GP or making sure a child goes to school. If parents find they need a bit more help, there is something called early help. Parents can ask for early help themselves or it may be offered to them. The aim of early help is for parents to get support before small problems get worse and turn into bigger problems. For example, they may need help to cope with a crying baby, understand why dental treatment for their child is important and how to get it, or understand what kind of a food their child needs to grow up strong and healthy or deal with the teenager's behavior. It may also be a child who needs help, not their parent. For example, they may need help because they have a special educational needs. For example, they need a speech therapy. 
The early help team should support parents and stop problems getting more serious. For this reason, it is a good idea to work with them. But if the social worker gets involved and thinks that the things are not improving, they may also suggest that your child would benefit from something called a child in need plan. The law in England says that a child is in need if they aren't likely to reach a reasonable standard of health or development without extra help or services. Development means the process of growing up from a child into an adult and includes a child's physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and behavioral growth. For instance, when they are expected to crawl, walk, speak, eat, read, or write. The law also says that any child who has a disability is automatically a child in need. Children's services will work with parents if they think that their child is in need. There is also child protection, which usually starts with a referral. A referral starts if someone calls children's services if they are worried about the safety or well-being of a child. After being contacted, social workers have one working day to decide what to do next. We will talk about a child protection process a bit later. And finally, care proceedings. Care proceedings can happen when children's services have serious concerns about child safety and will want to apply for a care order. This means that the local authority will share parental responsibility for a child and can decide where a child can live. Children's services must go to court to get a care order. Thank you, Mary Ken Rowan. But can we take a step back now? And can I just ask why, why is it that children's services become involved with families in the first place? I mentioned before that it usually starts with a referral. For example, a teacher or a doctor or a neighbour may feel worried about a child and would like social workers to look into this. They will call their local children's services and tell them why they are worried. If children's services get a referral, the law says that they must look into that child situation. The law is very clear about this because in the past, some children have died because nobody stopped their abuse. After being contacted, social workers have one working day to decide what to do next. They can decide that emergency action may be necessary to protect a child from danger And that, for example, they should go and live temporarily with another family member, a family friend or a foster carer. Or they want to know more about a child and their family. This is called an investigation. They may also decide that the child and their family may need support as soon as possible to help them cope and stop a small problem from getting bigger. Or they may think that there is no need to take any action because of a child hasn't been harmed and they don't think they are at risk of being harmed. Advice Now's guide explains in a bit more detail how investigations and assessments are carried out and what you can do if you find yourself in this situation. Okay, that's really helpful. But what makes social workers decide that they need to be involved in a family's life? Essentially, a social worker needs to work out if the children are suffering or are likely to suffer significant harm. If they think they are, they need to get involved. Can we look at an example? Yes, of course. Here is one short scenario. Can I ask you, Teresia, to read it, please? Sure. In our scenario, we've got a family who lives in a small village near Manchester. They have two children, Anna and Lucia. Lucia has recently been diagnosed with autism and she's also partially blind. One day, whilst coming to school, Lucia started hitting Anna and mum found it difficult to separate them. In the end, mum slapped Lucia. One of the parents saw this and told the teacher. School was concerned by what the other parent said and asked mum to meet the safeguarding officer at school. What is your opinion based on this case scenario, Erica? Thank you for this, Teresia. There are several things in this case study that may give social workers a reason to get involved. There is a child with a disability, Remember, the law says that any child who has a disability is automatically a child in need and a children's services should provide help and support for this family. There might also be a problem in managing Lucia's behavior as she was hitting her younger sister. Parents might be struggling to manage Lucia's behavior but also failing to protect their younger daughter, Anna. Finally, one parent saw that mother slapped Lucia. 
This might be something that mother does regularly and children's services might want to see if Lucia or her sister might be suffering from harm because of physical abuse. This is just one example and we could give different examples here to illustrate four possible types of harm as a result of. So number one, neglect. Neglect can happen when someone does not look after a child properly. For example, they don't feed the child enough, don't make sure that the child goes to school regularly or on time, don't look after a child's health, frequently leave a child dirty or without adequate or clean clothes, don't make sure that a child is safe and well looked after or don't protect them from danger and so on. Second one is a physical abuse. Physical abuse is when someone deliberately hurts a child or treats them badly. For example, by hitting, shaking, slapping, burning, throwing things at them, and so on. Third one, emotional abuse. Emotional abuse is when someone doesn't do things that are important for a child's healthy development, like showing them love and care. Emotional abuse is also when someone upsets or frightens a child, for example, by telling them they are worthless or unloved all the time, or calling them bad names, picking on them, or damaging their things, frequently frightening them, perhaps by shouting at them, making fun of, or repeatedly criticizing them. Witnessing domestic abuse is another example of this type of harm. Social workers take domestic abuse very seriously. Even if children aren't physically harmed, it is still really damaging for them to grow up in a home where their parents are in an abusive relationship. And fourth one, sexual abuse. This is when an adult touches a child's body or their private parts or makes the child to do sexual things like touching someone else's body or private parts. Sexual abuse also includes actions like allowing a child to look at films or pictures of a sexual nature or getting them to send pictures of themselves with no clothes on over the internet. Sexual abuse often occurs from a trusted relative or family friend which parents are unaware of and therefore fail to protect their child from it. Child sexual exploitation is a type of a sexual abuse. It can involve a child being given food, somewhere to live, drugs, affection, presence, status or money in return for doing sexual things or having sexual things done to them. Sometimes family circumstances can be complex and involve more than one type of harm. You can find a lot more information about types of harm in Advice Now's guide and our film, Keeping Our Children Safe. Okay, we now understand what may cause social workers a concern. But how long do social workers stay involved with a family? This is a really good question, but the answer is not straightforward and everyone's situation may be different. First of all, it is very important to understand that if parents engage well with a social worker and other professionals involved, the whole process can be quicker. Please watch the short film Keeping Our Children Safe for more information about what you can do to help parents who are going through the child protection process. It is also a good idea to watch this film with the family you're supporting. It is in Romanese and with the English subtitles and it can really help families. You can play it on uh, your phone when visiting a family or you can send them the link for this video and they can watch it on YouTube. The link for this film is below this video. And please also look at the section in Advice Now's guide, Working with Social Workers and Other Professionals. This section addresses some of the most common problems that Roma families can face in the child protection process and how you can support them through it. Thank you, Rowan. That's really helpful. Erica, could you explain what can happen after the referral to children's services? Yes, certainly. So if children's services decide they need to know more about a child and their family, they will carry out an investigation. Part of that investigation may include visiting the home or a child or children, children, speaking to other professionals involved with the child, such as teachers, health visitors, police if relevant, looking at the family's social media presence, and so on. They can also make an unannounced visit, um, and if they do, it's best to let them in. They will want to see the children and may ask to speak to them alone. They may also want to look around the house, including checking inside the fridge or cupboards. Many people find this very intrusive, but the social workers want to know, for example, that the children are being fed. After this, 
they may wish to do an assessment to consider all the information they have collected about the family in order to work out if a child is a child in need or is suffering or might be at risk of suffering significant harm as a result of abuse or neglect. They will also work out what services and support a child may need to improve their well-being. If at the end of the assessment, a social worker is concerned that a child might be suffering harm in their family, they will invite a group of professionals involved in the life of the family for a meeting. This is called a strategy meeting. They will then decide if a child protection investigation should start. Parents will not be invited to this meeting. If professionals that attend the strategy meeting decide that they are worried about a child, a social worker will organize another meeting between them, other people involved in a child's life, and the parents. This meeting is called a child protection conference. The people at the conference will make a decision if a child needs to be placed on a child protection plan. Uh, the plan should set out the concerns that have led to the decision to make a child protection plan for them, what help parents and their child or children will get, what parents need to improve, what will happen if parents don't manage to make the changes, how much improvement is needed, what a social worker and other professionals will do to help protect a child and by when, what the professionals expect to come out of the process in terms of a child's improved well-being and who will review parents' progress and how this will be done. The child's wishes and feelings and parents' views must be considered when setting out this plan. Children's services are always supposed to work in partnership with the parents. The social worker will review the plan every three to six months. In between those meetings, a smaller group of professionals who have most contact with the child will meet regularly to help everyone make the plan happen. These meetings are usually called core group meetings. Thank you for this, Erika. As we see, it is really important to attend these meetings, to be on time and to get some support. Parents are allowed to take an advocate or a friend with them. This can help them feel a bit more comfortable and calmer. A support worker can take notes and make sure that parents understand what is happening. As we know, parents can get emotional, overwhelmed or confused and it is important to reach out for support. Parents should also remember that they should get legal help from a solicitor as soon as possible. You can also find top tips to help you get ready for a child protection conference from an organisation called Family Rights Group. They are an organisation that supports parents when social workers make decisions about their children. The Family Rights Group runs a free and confidential telephone advice service. You can find their details at the bottom of this video. They also have short films about child protection conferences, which can help you get ready for it. We also include the link to these films below this video. Thank you, Rovan. I should also add that the process can look different depending on individual family circumstances. For example, if children's services or police believe that there is a risk to your child's life or they are at risk of suffering serious immediate harm, for example, they have been left at home alone or physically harmed or are being looked after by someone who is giving them alcohol or drugs, then they might apply for emergency protection order at court. It means that the children's services are responsible for looking after and protecting a child while the order lasts. Usually, a child will be placed with a foster parent or with a family or family friend during this time. If there isn't time to get a court order and a children's services believe that someone might harm a child immediately, then the police may be able to temporarily remove a child and hand them over to children's services. If any of this happens, it is really important to contact a solicitor immediately. Thank you for this, Erika. Another question would be... Um, what, what happens if social workers think that the families are not making the necessary changes? Children's services might start care proceedings and apply to court to remove a child from their parents' care. Unless things are very urgent, children's services must organise a special meeting with parents before they go to court. The parents will receive a letter inviting them to the pre-proceedings meeting and it will clearly indicate that these meetings is usually parents' last chance to talk to the social workers about how they want them to care for their child and the changes they want them to make. If parents are able to make 
the changes that the children's services want, then they may be able to stop them going to court. You may hear this meeting called a pre-proceedings meeting. It's always important that parents go to this and any follow-up meetings and that they take a solicitor specializing in children law with them. Their services will be free for this meeting. If a family doesn't make a changes, children's services will then go to court and start care proceedings. Can you just explain what this means, Erica? Yes, certainly, Theresia. A care order is a decision of the court giving children's services parental responsibility for a child and allowing them to decide where your child lives and who they see. If the court makes a care order, children's services will be able to make decisions about a child which parents may not agree with. The process of asking the court for a care order and going through the court proceedings is called care proceedings. This sounds very important and serious. How long do care proceedings last? Uh, the court should make its final decision quite quickly, within 26 weeks, six months of the case starting. A case starts on date when the court receives the application for an order from the local authority that runs the children's services where the family lives. This means parents usually have around six months from the start of the case until the judge makes their final decision. During the six months, the court has to make a final decision. The court will often make short-term or interim orders about how a child should be looked after and what contact they can have. The social workers also must show the court how they have tried to support the family to make the changes they think their child needs. You will find more information about the main stages in care proceedings in Advice Now's guide below this video. Is the outcome of care proceedings always the same? That's a good question, Theresia. There are a range of different outcomes. It depends on the case. If the court decides that there are enough reasons to justify making a court order, then a child will either go home if the safety and quality of your parenting has improved or the child go and live with a relative or another person or go and live with a foster parent or the child will be adopted. And is the court order decision final? Generally speaking, yes. If the court makes a care order, it is sometimes possible to go back to court later to ask the court uh, to end the order, but only if all the changes that the court wants to see are carried out. Very occasionally, it might be possible to appeal the court order uh, made about a child. This is something parents should ask their solicitor or barrister about. Thank you ever so much, Erika. And from this, we can see how the child protection and care proceedings are processes that can last many months. So parents still have a chance to make the necessary changes. Before I ask you what advice you would give to families in this situation, I would like to thank you for briefly describing all the steps that we can go through when a child protection meeting occurs and court orders. And um, I will just like to um, get, say a big thank you and to the Roma families to work together in partnership with all the services to prevent and, and to improve the, the life of their children. Uh, Erika, what advice would you give to families in this situation? First of all, make sure you understand this process. Law for Life's film, Keeping Our Children Safe, and advice now's children's protection guide for Roma parents can help with this. You may also wish to ask a support worker based at your local Roma organization to help you read this guide and understand the relevant parts of it. This will give you confidence and strength to go through this process. Also get a legal advice from a solicitor as soon as you can. Advice now's guide also explains different ways that a solicitor can help you. Make sure you read this and take every advantage of this kind of support.